when I've, I've learned recently that quantum scientists are actually studying the languages of some of these cultures, the Blackfoot, the Hawaiians, because it's only in that context that they could understand how these cultures really had this very sophisticated technology and it, the, so many of the codes are in the language. For example, my ancestors could chant into stones and use stones as repositories of knowledge and then extract that knowledge from the stones. It seems so far-fetched and yet quantum scientists are actually validating what these cultures did for millennia. Aloha, and welcome to the episode of the Ground Soul Origins podcast, where I connect you to outstanding humans and sustainable ideas. I'm your host, Scott Martin, and today we're going to paddle in an episode with Dr. Elizabeth Lindsay. She's a National Geographic Explorer, TEDx speaker, former Miss Hawaii, United Nations Visionary Award recipient, and a very good friend. Um, you'll notice in this episode she calls me Koa. We'll tell a little bit about what that is and, and what's the origins of that. I mean, I've become just, just absolutely like one of my favorite people in the world. I mean, just the amount of time that we spent together talking on the phone about, um, should have been recorded. Frankly, those were their own podcast episodes, but you know, um, just to the depth of which I've gotten to know her, she's just a beautiful soul and has so much to give and is going to lead so many people to just incredible outcomes. And when you hear her story and sort of the more in depth of, of some of that ancient knowledge that she brings to, to business and, and to this world. Um, I just couldn't be more honored to have her in this episode. And so without further ado, let's paddle in. All right, here we are with an episode of the Groundswell Marketing, or actually Groundswell Origins podcast. I'm still doing that as a, as a habit. And today we have the one and only Dr. Elizabeth Lindsay. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be with you. Finally, after almost a year of talking about being on my podcast, um, I think we held off. We've been doing lots of clubhouse rooms together and um, on mindful marketing, and we've had countless conversations that literally I feel like, I remember one, we had almost two and a half hours. I was in Yuki, and we literally said we should have made that a podcast. So we've had lots of conversations. So here we are at last. At last. (laughs) <laughs> so let's just give a little background. Um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about uh, some of your professional career and background like with National Geographic and some of the initiatives, and we'll kind of dive into some topics. Great. I'd love to. So I was born in a very small town on the North Shore of Oahu in Hawaii, and that's where you and I share a lot in common because I, was, I grew up on the ocean. And it was a poor town surrounded by sugarcane fields and plantation workers. But growing up, I never felt poor because we were surrounded by Hawaiian elders who taught us a lot about wisdom and our true wealth. And so it framed the rest of my life with the fact that everything that we seek lies within us. And and then at the age of seven, they predicted that the world would someday be in trouble and that I would travel far away to keep the voices of these elders alive so that their wisdom wouldn't be forgotten. And what's so interesting about that is because we were so poor, going to Honolulu was a big adventure for me. So the idea of going around the world was the equivalent of going to the moon. And sure enough, their prophecies came true. And I've spent a lot of time traveling. I think I've been around the world 14 times now. And by being around the world, you've been in some of the most remote corners of the world, um, talking about the most, you know, amazing stories and and experiences. Why don't you share a little bit about what that looked like? Sure. So one of my mentors, probably the greatest mentor that I've had besides my father and these elders, was a man named Mao Pi Lug. And Mao was from Micronesia, a very small island in the Pacific and was considered a grand master wayfinder, a navigator, a celestial navigator. And the things that he could do were so extraordinary that I ended up um, earning a PhD in ethno-navigation so that I could really understand the mastery and wisdom behind wayfinding. Nice. And you had this long story, or is it still ongoing career within National Geographic? You want to share a little bit about that? Sure. So 
Many years later, I was preparing to lead an expedition to Sadawal, to Mao. He was very sick, and we knew that he wouldn't be with us much longer. And to get to his islands, really difficult. So I, I was fortunate enough to have a crew that who were all willing to go with me to this very remote spot of the world. And we had to arrange a cargo ship to get us there because it's so remote. National Geographic's never been to this island. And when they heard about the expedition that I was leading, they started to track my work. And to become an explorer for them is a great honor. You know, it's something that you can't apply for. It's not a job that you can apply for, but they have explorers that are doing tremendous work in the world. I mean, some of our greatest explorations, expeditions are with National Geographic explorers. And so I, in 2007, had my meetings with National Geographic when I got back from this expedition. And they said, if money was not an object, how would you spend the rest of your life? And I said, doing exactly what I'm doing. I love my work. I just want to be with elders. I want to listen deeply to their wisdom. I want to make sure their voices are never forgotten. And then they invited me to be an explorer for them. And I still am. Nice. And there's one expedition in particular that I remember you and I talked about in a in a clubhouse, which was the expedition that um, you had a wayfinder actually navigate from, I can't remember which islands it was, to Hawaii. You want to share a little bit? Because that's where you introduced the idea of wayfinding, and maybe that's a good segue. Yeah, this was my mentor. In Hawaii, we have a new generation, the next generation of navigators. They're tremendous navigators, and they were all students of my teachers of Mao's. Um, we're all students of Mao's, and there were other navigators in New Zealand and other parts of the Pacific. And they sail the Hokulea, across the Pacific, and now Hokula has gone around the world as a voyaging canoe that's really an inspiration to the world about how important our oceans are to us, and there are ocean elders. And one of our navigators is Nainoa Thompson, who's quite famous and is one of the ocean elders in the world. Amazing. And you were describing the, the I don't know how you would call it, the I don't know if it's the art or the the method or, or the very unique um, uh, way in which, you know, wayfinding occurs when you're bringing the islands to you and so forth. And that's, yeah. to me, is like where you and I really deeply connected about this intersection between ancient wisdom, languages, Hawaiian language, and, and this very essence of, of the way of exploring or bringing something to you, of manifesting, if you will, and that's just brought into the, there's so many conversations that I'd love to talk more about, but do you want to describe that to some detail so we can kind of help the listeners kind of understand a little bit what this wayfinding concept. Absolutely. So wayfinding is gaining your bearing. And the way the navigators do this is they synthesize bits of information that on the surface don't look like they're related. So for example, the, the rising and setting of sun, moon, and stars, the flight patterns of birds, the sequence and direction of waves. Now, how we can apply that in the modern world when people are looking at the financial markets, at the pandemic, and starting to synthesize all of that information to anticipate what could happen in the future, that's wayfinding. And so one of the ways that I work with companies and with individuals is to help them gain their bearings and then to establish a vision because in many ways, wayfinding is so perfectly layered to the modern world because people are trying to figure out how to get from here to there and navigate unprecedented waters. We're, we're in completely, um, we're sailing in uncharted oceans just the way we are on the sea when there are currents and conditions that we weren't anticipating. So wayfinding is the same way. We need to figure out how to make a safe journey from where we are to where we want to get to. And in what you're talking about, in the case of calling the island to you, it's a function of people really becoming very clear in their definition of what the island is. 
And what the navigators do when they're on the canoe, there is a seat specific for the master navigator, and only he sits in that seat. And he is holding the clearest, most unwavering vision of the island. It appears to the untrained eye that we're sailing toward the island, but for Mao and other navigators like him, they would harness their mana, their internal power, and draw the island to them. Draw the island to them. And yes. you reenacted this experience, didn't you, in a, in a story within National Geographic? I'm, I tell, ask me that again because oh, I'm not I thought sure it was like some story to. that you that they um, that you that you reenacted or or did this in 1980s or something. There was a story. I'm not sure if it was the 80s or 90s. I'm not sure, but I thought there was some story where it was wayfinding was actually demonstrated and documented. Oh, yes, yes. I thought National that was Geographic. you. But was that wrong? No, no, that was before me. It was 1976. The National Geographic carried this beautiful piece about Hokulea, the, okay. the canoe we were talking about, and Nainoa, who was also a student of Mao's and a famous navigator. They voyaged between Hawaii and Tahiti, and they used all of these practices to get to Tahiti and back home to Hawaii. And, you know, what is so important is that we're constantly we're constantly applying these things. It's just that most people are either not conscious of it or not intentional of what they're drawing, about what they're drawing to themselves. So, you know, with Tony Robbins, he talks about this a lot, maybe not in the context of wayfinding, but in Hawaiian thinking and in cultures throughout the world, they believe that what we carry in terms of our vision and what's in our mind and the words that we choose are all drawing to us what it is we're calling for. And that becomes our chant. You know, conscious or unconscious, intentional or unintentional, we are constantly drawing things to us because like attracts like. And one of my favorite quotes says this, we do not attract that which we want. We attract that which we are. So we are always... If we are wise enough, we're seeing exactly what's coming to us. It becomes our responsibility and our point of power to shift that if we want some different results. Makes so much sense. Like if you think of branding, the more clear, like when you work on brand strategy, you're getting total clarity about the vision that you have. And and we use sometimes what's called, not sometimes, I do, it's called brand mantra, which is what is the feeling you want to um, people interacting with your brand at any point in time, what is that feeling you want them to have? And that by describing that feeling, that interaction, the, the, the essence of your brand, what do you have to do to actually achieve that? And it's like getting really clear about what that interaction is. And the way you're also describing is goal setting. When Tony Robbins talks about getting very clear about your goal. So this whole reenactment was they used all the tools of their mind, not the stars in that traditional navigation to not make it a, a urban legend. It was actually a demonstrated as a truth, uh, yeah. which I found absolutely interesting when I first heard this story. Yeah. And it heightens what happens with wayfinding is it heightens your awareness, your state of awareness, but every culture has similar traditions and practices. And for us in the West, it just becomes a function of our being much more intentional and deliberate with the way that we live our lives. Yeah, it's like when you hear of somebody that loses a sense, all the other senses are heightened because they're, yeah. there's more awareness and attention sent to them. And, you know, when you and I were first talking about this, it was just more, I think people making, you what you're doing is you're helping people become aware of a possibility in this. this but I think that was people try or or understand this, they're opening themselves up with intention to actually experience it, where we kind of go through life and we don't, without that knowledge, we just are not actually leveraging that, that incredible possibility for ourselves. It's absolutely true. And one of the things that Mao taught me is that we have an inner guidance system that is so precise but so many people in the modern world don't rely on that compass. 
And what the navigators do is they navigate by both their reason and logic, which is all of the incoming data that they synthesize, but the intersection is between the mind and the heart. And in that intersection is a still point that if people really become much more aware of the mind and the heart coming together, that's the sweet spot. That's where all of the answers wait for us. You know, Rumi was brilliant when he said, your heart knows the way, run in that direction. It's really true. Every culture tells us that. I love that word still point. So that's yeah. the intersection, the exact intersection of your heart and your mind working congruently. That's, that's what you're right. saying? That's Interesting. right. That's and all of the science today is showing us that we think that we're getting data through our minds. In fact, what it's doing is it's coming through the heart and very rapidly transmitting to the brain. So, you know, we underestimate the power of the heart. And what's really lovely is um, when Hawaiians when Hawaiians name their children, it's usually it usually comes in dream names before the children are born. And so the dream name for me came to my father. And um, my Hawaiian name is Kapu'uwailani, which means the heart of heaven. Mm. That's a beautiful name. Amazing. And, you know, it's funny because I don't know if you, I don't maybe, did you say, I don't know if you, when you and I talk, you don't call me Scott. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. And we have this a little story with that. It's, uh, she calls me Koa. And it's because of a story that I expressed about uh, a Tony Robbins exercise where you're, you had to come up with a name um, to really summon your, your deepest desires of what you want to do. And, and uh, long story short, I'm a, my, my voice was, was uh, wrecked a little bit like it is now. And I couldn't say the name that I wanted to say before. And I kind of uttered this sound that was like Koa. And my wife said, Hey, I bet you that's a word somewhere. And then about an hour later, she gives him a phone. And she goes, oh, my God, it's a Hawaiian word. And uh, it's for tree. And I thought, oh, my gosh, that's like perfect for me because I, as everybody knows, I spent a lot of time in Hawaii and I have such a deep affection for it. And it just felt natural. And then I, I learned it was actually the wood for the first surfboards. And then I met you. And you and I had this long discussion about the origins of the words of the Hawaiian words and the intentionality of, of those words. So for example, those of you listening to this podcast, she, I'm going to let you, if you don't mind explaining in a moment, um, I introduce it with Aloha and Mahalo. And to me, I've always, I just love that way of introducing. It's not about being different. It was about being genuine. It's about making a connection and closing off like a bookend, my experience of trying to interact with this audience. And then you had some things to share with me, both about Koa and Aloha and some of these words. I'd love for you to share it with everyone because I think we can tie it back into there is so much of this that you and I are excited about that this Hawaiian culture and how it can really be adapted and and really understood for better sort of understanding wisdom in the world. Absolutely. I'd be so happy to. So about your name and I call you Koa and that's what came to you. Koa, there are two meanings for the word. One is the tree. And the beautiful thing about these koa trees, it's one of my favorite woods, is that the, the tree that stands alone apart from the forest actually takes on all of the forces of the wind and the elements. And what happens is you see the grain and the wave in the, in the bark of the tree. And so you can tell which wood, which tree stood alone and really faced those conditions because of the waves in the tree. So I love that. The other meaning for koa is warrior. And to me, both of those definitions define you because you were like a warrior to me. I watch you so closely as a friend, but I admire you as a human being because I see you at the forefront of really taking in information, of really thinking through things with great authority and sovereignty. So it's not like you're going along because everybody, it's trending this way. You're standing alone and really thinking and coming to your own conclusions about things. And then you stand strong for what you believe in. And I know that for myself, I've always felt 
with you as a brother, I feel really protected because you represent to me that kind of strength and that willingness to own your authority in the truest sense of the word and stand for what you believe in really powerfully. And I always feel safe in that. So I love, I love the fact that that name came to you and that your wife then realized that it was a Hawaiian word, two Hawaiian words. Um, with regard to aloha and mahalo, both of them are, are sacred to me um, and to many of us. You know, they've been used in Hawaii almost in a commercial way. But when we look at the essence of the word, it talks about, because you see ha in both words, aloha, mahalo, it talks about our ha, our breath of life, our life force. It's, it gives, it, it is everything. And for us, you know, we understood that aloha is the ultimate love. It's the ultimate expression of pure, unadulterated love. And we knew, we were told by our elder Pilahi Paki that aloha would be a key that would serve the world during these times of trouble because love is the answer. And love, true love, is a reminder of our interconnectedness with all things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Like, I, you know, for me, aloha, it's like I always felt it embodied more than just it was a gimmick at all. I always felt there's something deep about it, something about like, I recognize you, I see you as you are, I respect you, and I come here as your equal. And I just feel like it sets this table of such, you know, a connection. Like, you know, we can't sitting at a table eating together, but we're, we're talking together, it has that same essence. You know what I mean? And that's it, kind of where I really feel does. about it. And, you know, the, they really, they understood that when you speak, it's why when they chant, it is the embodiment and the fullest expression. It, when I've, I've learned recently that quantum scientists are actually studying the languages of some of these cultures, the Blackfoot, the Hawaiians, because it's only in that context that they could understand how these cultures really had this very sophisticated technology. And it, the, so many of the codes are in the language. For example, my ancestors could chant into stones and use stones as repositories of knowledge and then extract that knowledge from the stones. It seems so far-fetched, and yet quantum scientists are actually validating what these cultures did for millennia. And that was a large part of some of your research, your exploration is, and, and frankly, maybe your mission, that is, I understood it, is protecting some of this ancient knowledge. And, and that is where I believe there's this resurgence, and, and you've been a big part in, in revitalizing that of these the power of these ancient um, languages and rituals and, and different things. And before it feels like it, 10 years ago, that felt like a really far reaching radical idea. It doesn't seem so radical anymore. It, it, the acceleration in just the short amount of years. I mean, I remember mindful marketing. I thought it was like, I thought it was a heretic, you know, and now it's like, it doesn't seem like it's anything at all. It's, 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 it's things have shifted. I'm curious from your point of view in your, your career, where is it going and where do you see the insertion of this, of these, all this body of, of knowledge and ancient wisdom and, and language and so forth coming into business? Or do you see that being a no, no misuse of it? Um, or, or, or how do you see that? Like, what's your, what's your perspective? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. I think what's happening is that there is now a recognition and a validation of these systems of knowledge as valid and valuable. For example, there's a small area of, of study called ethnomimicry. So we understand biomimicry, where we learn from nature and then apply it to the modern world. Ethnomimicry is the same, except we're learning from culture. So here's one simple example. 
in India, they had these beautiful architectural, they look like temples, they're called step wells. And during the monsoon season, they harvest the water in these, in these step wells as reservoirs. And so during the dry season, these, these communities had water. And now these step wells are being restored by architects in Europe because they understood that these cultures were water harvesting long before we knew that we were gonna need water harvesting because water is becoming so much more scarce a resource. So that's ethnomimicry. And I think that as these things happen, we start to understand that these cultures had so much valuable knowledge that we now need. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's there, and if we just start to take a look at how these cultures lived, we have a lot to learn from them. And as an anthropologist, I really value that. I mean, you know, the truth is I'm a, I'm a Western science trained anthropologist, and I was raised in an indigenous culture. So I, I walk this beautiful, I, I, I basically bridge Western science and native culture. Aloha. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And uh, that's another episode of the Groundswell Origins podcast. And as always, go to groundswell.fm and I'd have you kind of scroll down and click on the microphone and send me a voice. Send me what you think. Tell me something you liked or what you'd like to hear about. I love hearing the voicemails. Um, in fact, I might even do an episode with some of the amazing messages I got I get on my, on my speak pipe. So please leave a message. That'd be phenomenal. And until next time, Mahalo. Mahalo.